It's great to be with you again and to uh, just bring God's word to you. So we're going to continue in Romans. If you're a Bible, we're going to jump to Romans 1. As I said, we'll be finished by Christmas. I don't know what year, but by one Christmas anyway. So Romans 1 and cha- uh, well, chapter, Romans chapter 1 and verse 14. It says this, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish, which should give us all a little bit of occasion on there. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. For the gospel of righteousness of God has been revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, next week I'll take on the verse, the righteous will live by faith. But I will throw this out already to you. That that verse there, taken from Adam Cup 2 verse 4, is actually a verse that changed the world as we know it. And we'll go into it all next week for you, especially for probably most of us. But this verse is what changed the world, but also changed church as we know it. So we'll get into that hopefully next time. And then Ruth and Tony will then develop it in Galatians and Hebrews thereafter. So the verse I really want to take is verse 16 this morning. And I'm going to read it from the New King James Version. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. So if you want the title for this morning, I'm calling it The Four Fours. So you just don't say that too quickly, because uh, it's not like you're trying to speak trying, but The Four Fours. Because in the New King James Version, it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to every, sorry, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then the Greek. So there's four fours in there, so that's what we're going to take it, we're going to split it down to four, so it's straightforward. So the first part is, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's an interesting phrase is that, that Paul is actually saying, because he understood more about the gospel than probably anybody else in the entire Bible. Peter, James and John, they were all doing really great as disciples, but they still believed that the gospel, the good news, was for the Jews only. Paul had the revelation that it wasn't to the Jews only, it was also to everybody else, which we are very thankful for. Peter had the experience of of witnessing to the non-Jews, but still he he wanted to bring it back into the Judaism way of doing things where Paul says that's not what it's about. So he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ Jesus. So a question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we? Are we ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we ashamed of the good news? Well, obviously you'd say no. But in reality, are we ashamed? Many years ago, when I first got saved, I'd only been saved a short time. I'd announced it a few places, and I was telling people that things of God. And I'd gone to church on Sunday night, it was summer, and I'd arranged with my girlfriend to see her there after, after I'd been to church. She didn't want to come to our church. She went to an Anglican one, which was weird. Uh, her church was weird, that is, not that like she went to it. But, so I went to church, had a great time, and I nipped up towards the house, and I popped in at a shop on the way. And on the way out of the shop, I bumped into a friend, and he goes, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing great. He said, what are you doing down here? I said, I'm on the way to my girlfriend, which was true. But as I stepped away, it suddenly impacted me that, am I ashamed of the gospel? So I turned around and I said, so what are you doing around here? So he told me, so I said, well, actually, I'm down here because I've been to church. This is what's been going on, and I'm on the way to go. So I'd been honest, I'd not lied, but we're more to it. And from that moment onwards, man, he did something in me, and God did a number of things. Another one was deciding to go to an house group instead of going to a party. That broke that, so I've always gone to the house groups. Sunday morning, Sunday, the church has never been something that's been up for maybe, maybe not. It's always been regardless, I'm there, because I brought that when I was a, a young Christian. 
But this was another way. God just broke some of it so that I've never looked back and gone, I've never denied nor not taken the opportunity. So when anybody's ever asked me anything about God, I've always jumped in there because I've always thought, I don't want to be ashamed of the gospel. Like Paul, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And these verses really impact. This is what happened a couple of weeks later. I was reading through Matthew. Matthew 10 is a very challenging chapter of the Bible. Now, some people say, you know, it's in that crossover between the old and the new. So you've got to weigh this up and take it for yourself. But I would challenge you to read through Matthew 10 and listen to what Jesus is saying. But he says this, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. See, I didn't say that. That's what Jesus said. So if we deny Jesus... Is this verse saying they'll deny us? Now, let's not talk about salvation here, but there is a big question in what is he talking about and what's Paul trying to say? Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Maybe he said that because there were others who were becoming ashamed of it. Why? Because to become a Christian in Paul's time, even though it was so new, you often got disowned, you'd often get things taken off you, you could be in prison for it, you would be persecuted for it. And he said, in all that, I am not ashamed. Later on in his letters, he said, you know, don't be embarrassed because I'm in prison. So obviously people were embarrassed. Imagine this. If I got sentenced to a prison or under an accusation, would you be supporting me or go, hmm, there's no fire, no, no smoke without fire? You know, there's Christians all over the world that are in prison because of allegations that are unfounded. And even in our country, I know of a number of Christians, not so many, but a number of Christians are in prison because of allegations that are unfounded, yet they're still in prison. Well, our justice system wouldn't lock anybody up unless it were true. We don't know that. We don't know that. And if the devil's at work, he will put, put people in prison if he needs to. So, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's interesting how quickly we jump on a bandwagon. I mean, people who say I'm crazy, maybe they're right in one sense, over certain stuff. But it's only through time that you come out of your brain going, actually, and I sometimes want to say, I told you so. But God goes, I'm telling you not to. Okay. But Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So we need to be not to be ashamed of the gospel and not to be ashamed of Jesus. And we need to acknowledge him before, our, before people. Because he says, whoever disowns me, you know, Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me, I will acknowledge him. Or whoever disowns me, which is the opposite, I will disown him. So it's an interesting one, what we're we going to do. Now, do we need to run down with down the street with a t-shirt saying, I know Jesus? You know, if you ever want to sit on your own on a train or a bus, have a t-shirt that says, let me tell you about Jesus. Nobody will sit with you. That's a good thing if you want to sit to yourself. However, on the other hand, you know, if you want to talk to people, see, I always take the opportunity, sometimes I don't want to talk. There's times when I just don't want to talk to people. I just need some time, sit down, put my earphones in, pretend I'm asleep, especially when I'm on plane. If I'm, if I'm not with your family, I can't, I'm not that bothered. I don't want really on a train sometimes. I don't really bother. But God seems to bring people on my way. And then you've just got to. Or at least I have to. You know, they always tell me stuff it's like, the good one is, what do you do for a living? I go, what do you think I do? Because I don't look like a vicar. I don't know what a vicar actually looks like, but I don't seem to look like because nobody said I think you're a vicar, or a pastor, or a minister, or anything like that, or a priest, or something weird. And after the talk to them, I say, and we chat for a while, I give them a few guests, and I say, actually, I'm a vicar, a reverend. And they just, <laughs> and it opens up things. Or sometimes it shuts them down. But Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because he understood what the gospel really meant, especially for us who are Gentiles. It meant that we could come to God. Beforehand, only the Jews could come to God. Why the Jews? Because they were God's chosen people. God chose to be an example to the world of bringing the good news in. But they messed it up. Read the, uh, Acts 7, it's about Stephen's story, how they messed it up. But then they usually get it the second time. 
But before he ended up by telling them, forget it the second time, they'd already stoned him by then. So Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The second for is, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God unto salvation, unto salvation. If the gospel isn't presented, people won't know about salvation. You see, we need to tell people that there is a hell to run from and an heaven to gain. And there are things that we need to live right and honestly on earth. And people often say to me, Johnny, I'm saved. I'm under the grace of God, therefore I can do whatever I want. That's not the power of God unto salvation. The power of God's salvation is that it changes our lives. It makes us different. It doesn't... We don't change gently from the inside out. We're a new creation. You see, it's the power of God's salvation. It's not the power of God to bring reformation or bring education. It's not a process. It's not to develop us into better people. It's not to spark some light that was already in us. No, before we knew Jesus, we were dead. That were it. God didn't just say, I'm going to make you a better person when you accept me. He said, no, I'm going to bring dead people alive when you accept me. You see, Acts 4.12 says this. <coughs> to the next page quickly. It says, For salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind which we must be saved. That is Jesus, obviously. You know, there's no other name than Jesus Christ for us getting us saved. You see, the gospel is for lost people. It's not for good people. It's not for the bad people. It's not for the nice people. If you want to insult me, tell me I'm nice. Because that's not even a fruit of the spirit, and I don't like it when people call me nice. Because that's just beige. You know, he's really nice. What's that really supposed to mean? At least say, he's good looking. Oh, he's irritable. Or he's angry. Something, you know, give it a bit of definition in there, but nice isn't the fruit of the Spirit. But the gospel is given to lost people. The gospel is the grace of God. The grace of God that came to mankind through Jesus. Jesus demonstrates, you see, the gospel can be interchanged with Jesus and grace. They've all got slightly different meanings to it and slightly different tones to it. But in essence, it's God's love that he poured upon us. And one day we will worship him. We will stand before him and worship him. And we will stand in his presence forever, worshiping him. Why? Because of the power of the gospel and the power of the, you know, the power of God in salvation. As the Ephesians 2 says this, it says, For it is by the grace of God that you have been saved through faith. It doesn't say it's by the power of your good works or the power of you being nice or what you give to the church or to charities. It doesn't even say by the power of you going to church, going to a church building. It says it is for by the grace that has been, that, sorry, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself, it is a gift from God. So no one can boast. See, none of us can say we were good enough to come to God. In fact, if we think we're good enough, we won't need God. And therefore, we're definitely not good enough. But many people come to God thinking they're good enough. God's not interested in making nice people or good people better. He's interested in making dead people alive. You see, but grace does not make us into a better person. Grace is not, or the gospel is not there to improve our lives, to make us wealthier, to make us better. It's to make us that was dead alive. You see, many people say to me, Johnny, I don't really believe in evolution because I'm a Christian. We're supposed to believe in creation. Yet we often talk about progressively getting better as a person. God doesn't progressively make you better. He made you a new creation. It didn't say, I'm going to make you a little bit better. You see, there's a verse in the Bible that people often misquote. They say, we're going from glory to glory to glory to glory. No, it says we're going from glory to glory. Meaning we're going from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. What was has gone and what is is new and now. You see, you're not evolving into a Christian, a child of God. You are a child of God. But you don't act like one sometimes. But the matter, you're still a child of God. You know, some kids don't act like their parents. And sometimes their parents may be ashamed of their kids. They're still their kids. Because once they're born, they're born into the family. 
You see, God's not making us better. We were born again. We were made a new creature on the inside. Now, we do need to have our minds transformed and renewed. Romans 12, verse 2. We need to do that. And that's a progressive thing in our mind. But inside, we're already born again. Inside, we're already a child of God. And it doesn't matter where we go, what happens to us. We should get better generally. We should improve as we learn the word of God and trust in God. But in our spirit, we're already made complete, which is amazing. And Paul understood this. Because beforehand, you got better the more rituals you did. The more offerings you brought, the more sacrifices you did, you got better and better. But then Paul understood the gospel being the fact that you are now a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's one of my most favourite verses in the Bible because I realised the old John is dead. The new one's alive. The problem is that sometimes the old one gets back up and I've got to kill him again. Sometimes he tries to ambush me every now and then and remind me what I was like and what I did. And sometimes I've got to put him back down and shoot him. Romans 6, 23 says this, The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord, it doesn't say, The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Just come to make me all right. Be fine. No, it's only in Jesus Christ that we find eternal life. Why? Because he's the one who made us alive on the inside. You see, Jesus is love. We all like that one. Jesus is life. It's light. Sorry. But it's also life. But without Jesus, nothing on this planet would even exist. He's the one that holds it all together. He's the one that made it, and he's the one that holds it all together. If you don't believe you get into quantum physics. Think of atoms and neutrons and protons spinning around each other, and there's nothing holding them together. Well, Jesus does. Why? Because he's life. He's life, he's light. And his love, without Jesus would be no love. Imagine what his love is going to be like when the church is ripped out of it. Gone. When the agape love of God is gone with us. Now people still want to get saved and that's still carry on. But imagine what the world would be like without the church holding back. The wave of destruction and wickedness. But as for us, God's made us a new creation. You see, without Jesus, we are dead. We're not just bad people, we're not just weak. You know, you could be the most perfect person on this planet and sin once, and yet it has to God is wicked. And you know what the greatest sin is? It's not murdering, child molesting, raping. See, that's what we say it is. But to God, the greatest sin that exists is rejecting Jesus. And that's what makes the difference between heaven and hell. It's not the good or the bad that anybody <coughs> does, it's whether they accept Jesus or reject Jesus. Yet the church, in centuries past, you see, the New Testament church understood this. Right up to about the 4th and 5th century, they understood this. Then we enter a period of time called the Dark Ages. What's dark about it is because they took grace out and put ritual back in. And it took right up to the 1500s before a guy, which I'll get into next week, stood up and said, enough is enough. The Reformation happened and the grace of God entered back into the church and people started getting saved, started getting baptised in water, started getting baptised in the Holy Spirit, they started getting radically changed and they were marching on to the kingdom of God and then what happened? The church started, I'm talking generally, started bringing more and more rules. And you wonder sometimes what on earth, because we as people, we need rules. We need them because we need to know where we stand. We need to have the sort of guy, I'd ask a girl out, not now obviously because I'm married, she's functioning, killing me, something like that. But as a, as a, before I got saved, before I, I got dated, I'd ask a girl out because I need to know where I stand. If she said no, I could move on to the next one. If she said yeah, we could check it out for a while, if we didn't wait, but I don't that one, move on to the next one. And I needed to know where I stood. I couldn't ever muck around with stuff. It's like, Yes or no, are we there or we're not? I need to know. And the things with God is, God wants us to know all things. And he gives us his spirit. But in the church they brought rules in. Because grace is too good. Grace is just too good. And people will say, oh, but, but it's a license to sin. That's a good one, isn't it? It's a license to sin. If you understand it, I, Paul had the same problem. He says, what shall we say? Shall we go on sinning? Of course not. 
In fact, if you're truly saved, if you're a true believer, it will change your outward lifestyle. You won't want to sin. So it's not a license to sin. It changes you from the inside out, so you won't want to do it. See, in the Old Testament, it says, do not commit adultery. In the New Testament, under the grace and love of God, it says, love your wives. Well, if you love your wives, it means you won't commit adultery. But in the Old Testament, you could not commit adultery, but it didn't mean you loved your wife. You could treat her like rubbish, which some did. So, that's no one. So anyway, back to what... Uh, uh, mm. Over the next few weeks, after um, Tony and, and Ruth spoke, I'm actually going to look at, through chapters 1, 2, and 3, about where people stand concerning the power of God's gospel. Because people often say, well, what about the person who's never heard the gospel? We're going to look at that. What about the person who is upright and a good person? We're going to look at them. And then we'll look at the religious people as well, as we move through. And God's answer to all them, but that's in the weeks to come. So the third four, four, four but let's see, the third four is for everyone who believes. This is another one. It doesn't say for everybody who believes and does X, Y, and Z. You see, Salvation, if there were a figure on it, that would make people feel better. Because then we'd feel we could achieve something in God, we could pay something, we could sacrifice someone, we could bring a kidney, we could deliver a pineapple, whatever it might be. And God says, no, it's whoever believes. That's it. Well, that's too easy. A kid can believe, yes, and a kid can get saved. An old person can believe, and an old person gets saved. Paul says this, and he obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks to both the wise and the foolish. You've got to work out which camp you're in that one. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel to you also in Rome. Why? Because he says it's about telling people to believe, not telling them to do something. Yet when they believe, they will do something, but it starts off with believing. When many religions in the world, in fact all religions in the world, get you to do something, to achieve something, so you're good enough before God, and God said you'll never be good enough, just believe. Just believe. Fascinating, isn't it? It's too easy. Just have faith. Is it? Because, of, you know, because Jesus, Jesus is the only way, he's the one who opened up the way, he's the one who made the way, he's the one who set the price tag, and he's the one who paid it for us. Because we couldn't. Galatians 3.28 says this, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male or free male, just all, in, all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, 11 says this, there is neither Jew, so Greek, there is neither Gentile nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ in all and in all. What Paul's trying to put across is, there's not good and bad. There's not. Been, it's either in Jesus or out of Jesus. You see, in the, in the ancient world, there were two groups to the Jews. There were Jews, and there were the non-Jews, the Gentiles, the Gentile reptiles. They were, they were just there, they threw us out. But, but to the Romans, there were Greeks, which meant civilised people, and the non-Greeks, the uncivilised people. So that's why Paul just nails it off. The Scythians, uh, barbarians and Scythians, they were the lowest barbarians. They were real. They were from people from Barnsley. No, yeah. my family come from Barnsley, so I'm all right. No people from around Yorkshire places. But they were the lowest. But it says, but Christ is in all and in all. It says this in Romans 3.23, it says the righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile. There's a righteousness given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Not all who do this, this, and this. Not to those who come to church. Not to those who decide I'm going to be religious. To those who believe. Now, to those who believe, they often do become religious. And religious only means somebody who repeats the same thing. So some people religiously go to McDonald's. That's their church, and that's where they have their communion. And I'm not shaking a burger, whatever it might be. Some people religiously put on the left sock before the right sock. I'm glad people religiously take showers and use a bit of spray. That's quite good, isn't it? But 
For us, there should be a change of the inside that reflects on the outside. That's why the Bible says, by their fruits you'll know them. You see, believing is one thing, but, but if you truly believe it, it will correspond with your actions. People say, I believe in God, and I look at the life that I'm going, uh, really? Because if you really did, you need, a, you need a bit of a fear of God sometimes in there, friend, just to jump in that one. He said, this is it, John 3.36. He said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son has not seen life, but God's wrath remains on them. We'll look at God's wrath in a few weeks' time. It's still present, but whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. John 20, 31. This is at the end of John's Gospel, and he's just round it. <coughs> said, but these things have been written, that's the Gospel of John, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, you believe, and you put your faith in God, and he brings you alive on the inside, because you were dead. He's not resuscitating somebody who's just nearly dead. Without Jesus, we were dead. And the last one, point four, he says, for the Jew first, and then to the Greek. Let's make sure that is, yes, that's the fourth one. You see, to Paul, Paul making a distinction between Greek and, and the Jews, yet then saying there's no difference, one of the big step to him. You see, in those days, the Jews were so racist. You were either a Jew or you were filthy to them. Yet to the Greeks, to the Romans, they look at the Jews as being uncivilized in some of the things they did, and they're they ways of setting things. In societies today, we have dividing lines. It seems like there's dividing lines wherever you go. Everybody wants to divide everything up, but in the Bible, in the church, in the Word of God, it says there's neither this nor that. Yet today, there's always that draw, that strong line between male and female. Yet the Bible says there is neither male or female. You know, between this person and that You know, it never represents colour. Because in the church there is no colour. You're either saved or not saved. And it does make me smile when I watch different Christian TVs. I went to Africa years ago and it was so funny. Because I got this flimsy shirt on because it was 28 degrees autumn, which is you know, like our summer. And there's preachers there in the in the shirts and ties, waistcoats and, and a suit on, preaching, because that's what the see, think the image of the church is, because of Christian TV. Because that's what some ministers from America dress like. Yet if you go to India, the people who fall in the India preaching, and I think to me, I think people should stick to their culture, because the church doesn't have an exterior culture, as in dress code and food code, or, you know, be it, you know, it's a, the seating arrangements in churches. And yet, because of the Western world, it's kind of gravitated out as being the primary example of what church should be like. And yet, after travelling around the world a little bit, I like what I see in other countries. Because it's less formal in some cases, but they're trying to be formal. I think ch one of the best churches I ever went to was when I went to somebody's house, and we were just talking about God, and he said, let's break communion together. So he brought some, you know, there was about 12 of us by now, and we just had communion, and a church service, nobody really, one guy spoke for a little bit, others interjected, but the truth was, it was amazing, because we touched with God. And that was probably on a Wednesday night. It wasn't even on a Sunday morning. Do you know why we meet at 10 and 30 on a Sunday, or 10 or 11 o'clock? It's an interesting one. Because Martin Luther, who we'll talk about next week, used to talk theology on Saturday nights. And he used to stay up drinking beer, because he's a German, remember, and Germans drink beer. Um, so he'd be drinking beer, talking theology, and realised he couldn't get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, because that's when church was. Imagine that! 6 o'clock in the morning! Because that's when the sun grows up, so before that's when the church starts. So we had church at 6 o'clock, so Martin Luther said we'll meet at 7. And then we'd meet at 8 because he kept sleeping in, and then we'd meet at 9. And about 10 o'clock we couldn't actually manage to get to church. Some of you were still on that. We wish it was 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock. But the truth was, church moved to the mid-morning because Martin Luther couldn't get out of bed. And do you know why we had a Sunday night meeting? Traditionally. It's because that's when the servants went to church because all the lords and ladies 
was in church on Sunday morning while the servants cleared the house and got dinner ready, and then Sunday afternoon they would get off so they could all go to church. Hey, but it, but it came out yet. Yeah. But for us, Paul understood the power of the gospel, and he says there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's no, no, it's not, not Greek or barbarian, or male or female. He wasn't interested in that. He said you're either in the church or you're out of the church. There is now no distinction between any people, any group. You see, we all can track back as far back as Noah and then to Adam. So we're all from the same pod. Now I know some of you look different. We're all really different because we inherited what we are like from our parents. I'm just glad mine are good looking. It's kind of that way it goes. But it depends who you talk to, isn't it? Oh, look, I got my hair from my dad because he lost most of it. I think I'm telling me, middle brother, I think he's a doctor because he's got a right head of hair, but you can't walk best genes, can you? But Romans 10, 12 says this, For there is no difference between Greek or uh, Jew or Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call upon him. But remember where it said in Hebrews 11, 6, and that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and, I like to say, he's a rewarder of all those who diligently seek him. So we've got to come to him because we believe in him. He's, he richly rewards all, all those who call upon his name. The primary and first thing that God does to those who calls upon his name is he brings them alive. On the spirit is alive. That's why, if you remember, when you first got saved, things looked different. Now, if you got saved when you were a, a little kid, it, it, it may be harder to remember. But when I remember when I got saved, everything looked different. Everything changed. People were different. People were weird. People thought I was weird. But everything changed. But God says, we're all the same now. And especially for those who diligently it because it brings the light on the inside. But a question to ask is, why to the Jew first? Well, we could trap that back to Abraham. Why? Because he's the first one who believed in him. Well, the first one that's documented and believed in him. And he set up a Jewish nation because God needed a people. He needed a people who could become priests for the world. But they didn't. They messed things up so they had to have one part and became priests for themselves. And they never got their act together. So that when Jesus did come along, another reason why he needed the Jews is because the way the world was going, there'd be no line from Adam that was pure enough to get to Jesus, to have, this, to have Mary there, ready to have Jesus. Because they've all been quite messed up by them, but he kept them safe and he kept them, uh, um, looked after them so that Jesus could be born. But when Jesus was born, he became the way for all mankind, you and I. And that's what Paul struggled with all his believing life. After, before he got saved, he, had, he could not entertain a God that would accept the Gentiles, the dirty dogs, to come in. And afterwards, he still couldn't believe that God would do it, but he knew he did. And he's like, wow, this is so amazing. But we need to remember that Jude go first. Why? Well, Jesus actually said this to the Samaritan woman. He said, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Why was it from the Jews? It's because Jesus was Jewish. We serve the Jewish king. And one day he will come and sit on the throne in Israel, the throne of David, and rule the earth from Israel. We'll find out more about that when we get to chapters 9, 10, and 11, about Israel's future, their present predicament, um, what's going to happen to them, and their future. It's all documented throughout Romans. So you're getting a lot for you this morning, aren't you? Yeah. So you're doing well. But it says that Paul ministered, whenever he ministered, anyway, he'd often go first to the Jews. Now, given the fact that God had called him to go straight to the Gentiles, he still kind of wanted to tell the Jews. Why? Because this gospel was so good, it was too good, and the Jews couldn't accept it. People often say to me, I can't accept a God who would do that or do this. And they kind of, because of his grace, they tell me they couldn't accept a God who would accept them. It says, he accepts anybody. You know, I, like, I was actually witnessing something. They said, I can't become a Christian. I said, why not? And they mentioned somebody who they knew 
In fact, they've been greatly hurt by this person. And then later on, like this person who become a Christian, radically changed, because I knew of this person, radically changed. And he said, if God can accept them, I want not to do God. I went, what? I said, then you think you're better? He said, I'm a lot better than that person. I said, yeah, yeah, but you're still not good enough. But he couldn't get it. His stumbling block was God's grace became a stumbling block. His goodness should lead us to repentance, but for this person it became a stumbling block. But through time and persistence they realised that they were no better than the person who seriously had hurt them before God. And in fact it's none of us are good enough. It's the power of God. You know, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God and salvation. Um, for for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and then also for the Greeks. It's the power of God. And that's why we don't need to be ashamed of it, because Paul wasn't ashamed of it. And if anybody would have been ashamed, it would be Paul. Because he couldn't get his head round fully, but Peter definitely couldn't, why God would accept us. I don't mean the English. Yeah, some people would question that. You know, he couldn't get his head round why God would open up his house to anybody who believes who didn't come through a ritual circum through circumcision or through marriage or through sacrifice who could just believe we should make a smile <coughs> not for God's soul of the world but again it was some that whoever believes in or whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life that means the good people whoever believes in him and the bad people, whoever believes in it. But we, <laughs> see I appreciate where I come from. I know that <laughs> without God, I'm a total lost. The truth was, we're all lost. But in essence, God just thinks, pours his love upon us because of his grace. And this is the verse I just really want to end with. And there's two verses. And, um, I'll end with this one, I'll end with this one verse. This is from Philippians 1, 3 to 5, uh, 6. And it says this, I thank my God every time, this is Paul writing, that I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership with the gospel from the first day until now. Now Paul is writing Philippians from a jail, probably in Rome when he wrote this, and it's a church that got planted in a jail. So you back it up a little bit, you find out that this is when Silas and him were worshipping God and having a great party, chained up and God shut the prison and he planted a church on it. So years later he's now writing back to the church that he planted in a prison and he's writing from a prison. But he said, I always thank God for your partnership in the gospel from the first day on that. And he says this, this should encourage you. Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. See, what God starts, he finishes. So if he made you alive in him when you believed and trusted him, he's got a purpose and a plan for your life. And if you keep walking that plan, he will finish what he's promised. He will finish and he will bring to completion everything that is needed in your life. Sometimes it's generational, it passes on to the next person, but God will always complete it. So I have been encouraging for you this morning, and a blessing, so you're going to have to go away and read the rest of the Romans now, to find out what happens in chapters 9, 10, 11. Yeah. Chapters about the Jews. Find out in the next three chapters what happens to the guy who doesn't believe, to the guy who's religious, and to the guy who thinks he's A-OK. -okay. Read up on that one. And if you really want to get blessed, read the rest of it as well. <laughs> Let me pray for you. And uh, we'll have a time of fellowship. Lord Jesus, thank you. But Lord, that your grace, that your mercy is so amazing. Lord, that you poured out your blood and on that cross, you died for us, that we may have life. Lord, knowing that no matter if we were brilliant people, yet without you, we were still dead. Lord, whether we're bad or good, we still needed you. And I thank you, Jesus, that you paid the price, you made a way so that we could come to you. That we may one day stand with you face to face, giving you glory and worship, giving you honour that's due your name, and thanking you for all the great things you've done in our life. 
Lord, it's only then when we look back and realize how amazing you've been to us all our lives. Thank you for all that you're doing. Amen. Amen. <coughs>